Okay. So welcome all of you in this uh, 38 um, Professor Anand Krishnan Colloquium of IITM. And we are very fortunate today to have with us uh, Dr. Nils Vedi, uh, Principal uh, Scientist and Head of uh, Art System Modeling in uh, European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. And uh, uh, in this uh, uh, one hour lecture we have in a, a brief panel uh, where uh, Professor Ravi Anjundaya from IITM and Dr. Krishnan, Professor J. Srinivasan from IISC Bangalore, and uh, DJ MIMD, Dr. Mahapatra. Uh, they also will be uh, there in the panel. Now, before uh, starting Neil's lecture, I will just give a very brief uh, I mean, introduction of Dr. Neil's Vedi. So Niels joined European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting in 1995, and he received his PhD degree from the Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich. And um, uh, he's, uh, he's uh, since 2010, he's principal scientist and head of our system modeling in ECMWF. And he's also uh, the scientific coordinator of the European Age 2020 project of ESCAP. And, uh, he will be co-chair of uh, WIGNI from uh, WMO Working Group on Numerical Experimentation from 2021. So with this brief outline, uh, I will request uh, Dr. Nils Vedi to start his lecture. Nils. OK, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, I hope you can see that. Um, so it is a great honor to uh, be allowed to talk at this special colloquium in honor of Professor Ananta Krishnan. And um, I noticed that he was director of IITM uh, when I was born in 1969. So um, in a way, this is a presentation of um, using technology that has its 50th birthday this year um, and used by, if you like, the second generation um, following from Professor Anand Takrishnan. So I hope you, you enjoy this, um, this talk. Um, this talk will be about the recent simulation where we have pushed, in fact, this 50-year-old technology to new heights by uh, running a one 1.4 kilometer grid spacing global simulation with our established weather forecasting model IFS, DCMWF. And uh, this is just an illustration of the different simulations we have performed. So in the middle, you see the nine kilometer simulation forecast, uh, which is uh, resembling essentially what we run every day in operations to produce our medium range forecasts. On the left, you see the new 1.4 kilometer simulation, um, which in fact was a seasonal simulation. So it ran for four months. Um, so think monsoon and, and you know other predictions where this could be applied in the future, where we explicitly simulate convection and uh, in particular explicitly simulate deep convection. So this is obviously one of the um, future development areas where we expect basically breakthroughs because the convective parameterizations, while they have been substantially improved over the years, um, still present a certain amount of uncertainty in, um, in comparison to when everything would be explicitly resolved. But the problem is, when you look at the rightmost picture, where we have the nine kilometer simulation, where we also run without the deep convection parameterization, but now convection happens at a much too large scale. So simply switching off the deep convection parameterization clearly is not the way forward. And you have to have enough resolution, like one kilometer, in order to actually get uh, results that are, um, you know, of the similar quality in terms of, uh, you know, the, um, the global distribution, as you will see later in my talk, in terms of the global circulation as the existing nine kilometer simulation where we use the parameterization of connection. So this work is more detailed in this paper that you can see here before, which is now available on James. And, uh, and at the same time, I would like to thank, of course, all my coworkers 
in uh, producing basically these kind of simulations. So this is uh, me because it is not only the software technology, of course, that allows us to run these kind of simulations, but it's also uh, the underpinning of uh, one of the most powerful supercomputers in the world, uh, Summit, uh, host um, in Oak Ridge at the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility, OLCF, in Tennessee in the US. It used to be the largest, now it's the second largest with Fugaku um, in Japan becoming online. Um, and basically, I'm very grateful that as part of this insight program, I have been allowed to use this machine with the IFS. Of course, there were efforts to try and adapt basically the code to this machine. And as you can see here, the motivations, um, you know, in order to, it's not only to run one kilometer and showcase that, but it's to, to push basically accelerator readiness because this machine is equipped with CPUs as well as GPUs. Um, it is to compare basically the quality of a dynamic core, of course, pushing limits. And as I said before, of course, uh, looking at what happens when we explicitly simulate deep convection. So the outline of my talk, really looking at how we are pushing performance and portability as well as complexity of the integrated forecasting system in the coming years. Um, how we move towards increasing realism with what we might call storm scale resolving simulations and a first digital twin prototype, a global seasonal simulation at 1.4 kilometer grid spacing on summit. So just to give you a historical uh, review of um, the evolution of the dynamic core at ECMWF and the model at ECMWF of the years, you can see that ECMWF has essentially doubled its horizontal resolution approximately every two years. This is closely related to the Moore's law with a doubling time of about 18 months. So uh, a synonym of evolving um, power in supercomputing over the years. Now there, there have been, of course, uh, dents in that curve in recent years because of technology advances being more, more difficult. And that's why, and also the, the power consumption of these CPUs and therefore a move towards accelerators like on Summit to have a better uh, computation of power versus what uh, consumed ratio. But nevertheless, uh, we do believe that uh, we can continue this path of increasing resolution um, to ultimately a one kilometer resolution um, here depicted in 2030, but maybe due to the advent of GPUs, it might be possible to push, to push this even earlier. So uh, just to give you an idea, we use still this, as I said, 50 year old technology of spectral transforms. Um, a spectral transform method in this model. And uh, you see here the number of points that we have to compute in our current operational model. So typically we're looking at about 9 billion points. Uh, and the picture is showing the MPI parallel distribution that we, where we distribute the data across basically the entire machine or entire parallel compute nodes um, in a particular grid point arrangement here as from our operational model. So this is about 9 billion points, and we are producing operations about 100 terabytes a day. And this new simulation, this 1.4 kilometer simulation that I mentioned earlier, it uses a spectral truncation of 8,000 waves, 137 levels. And as you can see, uh, each field is about 256 million points. And uh, the total is 352 billion points, basically. So if I multiply this with the number of time steps, because you produce the data, you want to look at the data, this is about a production rate of approximately 100 terabytes per simulated months. So this already indicates another big area of evolution that has to happen over the next few years. How do we deal with the I.O.? How do we deal with the data? And in particular, if you think of this in the context of an ensemble simulation. So this is just a schematic description of the spectral transform method. Um, every time step, you have to go from grid point space to spectral space and back to grid point space. There have been evolutions to these uh, to the spectral transform method. As I said, 
Uh, it's 50 years old. It started with Eliasson and Orzak. Uh, you know, other notable people have obviously contributed, and we're, we're really building this, of course, on the shoulder of um, many developments of the past. Machana, Burke, uh, Burke and Puri, Puri, uh, Kamal Puri uh, from India also contributed, in fact, to the development of the uh, spectral transform method. And in recent years, uh, we have added a fast Legendre transform and, uh, and other. Um, improvements like the cubic octahedral grid, which uh, I understand you're also planning to use in the future and which um, makes the spectral transformers very affordable. Here's just a quick uh, review of uh, you know pros and cons of this global spectral transform method. Um, I don't want to go through all the details, perhaps just highlighting a few things like uh, um, variable resolution uh, has been also investigated. I mean, one of the features of this TCO grid is that it actually puts a bit more higher resolution near the equatorial area. So this is, of course, interesting in particular for monsoon type predictions. Um, but there, um, but there is also other attempts to increase resolution in equatorial regions uh, by Subu Ratnam. Uh, in 2012, which um, unfortunately hasn't really been developed further, but it was in the context of spectral methods. And maybe there is, a, in fact, further improvements possible here with more science to, to make this even more compatible, uh, uh, competitive um, in the, in the um, equatorial region. And there are other um, links um, that, you know, like, for example, reduced precision, which we have introduced and, and, uh, and other elements. Of course, on the con side, spectral ripples are still an element where, you know, in time mean fields, particular time mean precipitation, you would see spectral ripples, and this is an unsolved problem. So it would be nice to find solutions for that as well. And ultimately, of course, if we do have to go to non hydrostatic formulations, um, you know, my summit simulation here was hydrostatic, but if we have to go to non hydrostatic simulations, then there might be a question whether, um, you know, the when, the when the grid size in the vertical and the horizontal direction becomes the same, whether spectral methods are still the most appropriate approach is an open question. I mentioned ensemble prediction before, so I come a little bit to the applications of, of our model in our day-to-day -day forecasting uh, job. And um, <clears throat> so we don't run only an ensemble of forecasts, but we also run an ensemble of data simulations to describe the uncertainty in the initial conditions. And also as the forecast proceeds, we perturb the physical parameterizations and other uncertainties along the forecast trajectory in order to further the spread of each of the individual ensemble members to get the best estimate of the probability in this case of precipitation. Here's just an example, uh, a recent example, where we looked, uh, you know, as you may know, it has been a very active tropical cyclone season in the uh, Atlantic um, that has affected the U.S. coast. And here there's an example where we can see actually five um, evolving or evolved um, tropical cyclones on a single satellite picture. And um, the picture here, the, the moving picture, shows the 50 ensemble members that we have run, or 51 ensemble members, at our operational 9 kilometer resolution. So our current ensemble is at 18 kilometers. And, uh, and it showed in this particular case that we get um, a very good uh, coverage of these tropical cyclones when we further increase the resolution of our ensemble members. And this is likely to happen in the next few years at ECMWF. Uh, okay, so it is not, of course, only increasing resolution, it is also the increasing complexity, and in particular, again, in the context of things that concern you, like the monsoon prediction, the things that concern us, like tropical cyclones as well, um, it's the coupling to the ocean, for example, it's the coupling to sea ice and high latitudes, and of course, the coupling to the land. Um, and so this increase in complexity and the coupling to these different, what we call Earth system model components is also an essential part of the evolution of the integrated forecasting system. <clears throat> Here's one example. Ocean model resolution, of course, is also important. Currently we run a quarter degree ocean, which is the one in the middle where you start to see the ocean eddies to evolve. Uh, by sure, for sure not enough. Um, so we will likely have to push further resolution in ocean models, which brings own issues in terms of scalability and, and, and uh, affordability. 
But as you can see on the right hand, there's this famous picture by Holberg where he um, kind of looked at classified basically by latitude and, and the Rossby number of the dynamical evolution of the ocean dynamics. Uh, where you need basically which resolution. And you can see, of course, the coastal areas showing up, but you can also see um, that uh, maybe in the tropics you don't need as much horizontal resolution for the ocean models, but clearly then when you go to higher latitudes, the need for, for resolution increases. So here's another example where actually resolution also is important. This sort of um, pictures provided uh, by my colleague, Philip Lopez. You, uh, you can see here, this is how we currently represent the Himalaya uh, in our operational nine kilometer resolution. So um, yes, you see the mountains, of course, and you see the transition basically at the edge of the Himalaya towards some of the flatter areas. But um, you know, it's still pretty broad still. So the one kilometer simulation, however, that you uh, that that uh, I will show results for and that I have run on Summit has this kind of topography. So when you look at the difference, you clearly start to see basically the different areas. Um, you know, the um, the Kali Kandaki Valley, for example, of the Kandaki River, uh, showing up now very clearly. Um, you see basically the flatlands, uh, maybe here, the, I think this is sort of where the Chitwan National Park is, which um, I happen to have been in the past. And, um, you know, you basically start to see the realism and this increased realism, hopefully, actually translates then into uh, an increased realism of, for example, the uh, representation of convection. But with this, of course, also realism in water cycle reservoir representation, for example. So here you see pictures of the US snow depths and on the right hand side, the um, Euro-Asia snow depths. You see obviously here also the edge of the Himalaya uh, with different snow depths uh, and the, the Tibetan plateau. And, and you, these are important factors, of course, also that we find now influence the global circulation. And so we have to get the snow cover in these areas right. And we have to get the um, interaction with the land surface in these areas right. And these are um, possibly rather complicated basically transitions of water from the land into the atmosphere that our current schemes uh, need basically further research in order to improve the performance in these areas. What we can do in this particular case is we can run this already quite fast. So even we can run this already at one kilometer resolution if we force the land surface with an atmosphere and, um, and just run basically the land surface. This helps us to develop the model faster. And as you can see, we can run this already with about uh, one simulation year per day. So this substantially accelerates testing of uh, land surface parameters. And the focus of these land surface parameters is important because we want to have increased land real, you know, increased realism basically of the land using the land cover, of course, number one, coastal areas and lakes, snow over orography, catchment, hydrology, and ultimately urban areas. Because more and more people, of course, live in large cities and there will be an impact from, um, you know, ultimately also feedback onto the weather from these urban areas. And the description of these urban areas is something we're looking at also in the context, of course, on, um, you know, CO2 emissions. So it is a prerequisite, if you like, for an improved analysis of skin temperature and anthropogenic emissions. And coming to these emissions, really, ECMWF is also uh, heavily involved in the context of uh, ultimately attributing emissions and looking, you know, where they are coming from and how to better pinpoint and, and account for these emissions. And as you can see, in order to do that, we really have to go down to these um, resolutions of these emissions, which is around 100 meter to one kilometer. And uh, so this puts string and constraints also on the numerics that we use in our models. So horizontal and vertical transport, of course, uh, transport is a big uncertainty in this tracer. Tracer efficiency, especially when you have many traces, uh, you need to account for these different chemical interactions and uh, all of them need to be transported around. So there's another cost dimension that we have to account for in the near future. And there is uh, the big aspect of reanalysis as well. So here uh, in the context also of the stratosphere, so we're going deeper into the atmosphere. 
um, because we believe that the stratosphere has impacts, feedbacks in the longer time scales back onto the troposphere, but also just for the reanalysis for, for basically um, climate monitoring, as you can see in the top right picture, um, where we compare the surface temperatures um, from the recent August with the surface temperatures of all the Augusts between 1981 and 2010 to, to see how basically the climate has changed. And, um, and you can see that simple changes like in the numerics here had substantial impacts, for example, on the sudden stratospheric warmings uh, in comparison to the observations here of microwave radiances. So uh, further improvements of our models have substantial impact on this detailed uh, monitoring of our evolving climate. So ECMWF is working on different options for how we basically run this model. Um, I don't want to go through all the details here just to say we have what I will show is basically results from the hydrostatic model. Um, but we are working in the future on an evolution of the model which uses a finite volume technology. And this gives us complementary features like local computations patterns, uh, nearest neighbor, non-hydrostatic, I mentioned before, even better interaction with complex and steep orography, and ultimately also conservation of tracers and potentially mesh adaptation. These are features that are more difficult, basically, in spectral models. Another aspect how we manage to speed up the forecast model is to go to reduced position. So this is just, an, and we will move, in fact, uh, our next operational upgrade in the beginning of next year will be to introduce the single position model into operations. And uh, this basically paid for an upgrade of the vertical resolution of our ensemble. So we are upgrading from 91 levels to 137 levels in our ensemble. And it's purely uh, paid for by the acceleration we achieved by going to a reduced precision representation of the individual floating point numbers in the model. And here's just in a comparison um, of two different model cycles, single and double position, where we look at the tropical cyclone performance because obviously we don't want to, um, you know, compute less accurately and then miss a tropical cyclone evolution, but that is not the case. Another way of accelerating the model, which we are working on and, and which is also important, of course, for Summit that I mentioned earlier, is uh, the use of GPUs, of these GPU accelerators, where, uh, for example, for the spectral transfer in particular, uh, we managed to substantially uh, accelerate, basically, the, uh, the model's performance. So that at something like three kilometer resolution, we can achieve a time stepping of less than one second, which would, in principle, uh, fit operational needs. We are also working on a, a library that allows us to represent different function traces, what we call function space, so different representations of the model on the grid. So I mentioned the finite volume, I mentioned the spectral transforms, but there are ultimately other options that, for example, UK Metov has explored so in the context with mixed finite element, finite volume, or um, discontinuous Galerkin. Uh, spectral element methods, which are explored, for example, by the Navy in the US NRL. And we would like to have a modeling framework at ECMWF, which would in principle allow us to explore all of these options, ideally on the same kind of mesh to have a clean comparison, but um, certainly within the same computational data structure framework. And this is something that we have developed and that we're developing further. And FVM, our new dynamic core, is built on this uh, framework. Uh -huh. So ultimately, this is what we're looking for, a non-disruptive evolutionary approach, if you like, in dynamic core development with these, as I mentioned, different function spaces and ultimately perhaps moving away from the spectral transform method if we find that uh, communication basically and data movement, which is one of the drawbacks of the spectral transform method, um, are becoming overwhelming in terms of energy use or in terms of computational time. 
So performance and portability, as I mentioned, also is, is really important um, because we don't want to log in as necessarily only to one particular machine architecture. So we want to be flexible and open as actually the community is, uh, you know, HPC community is developing a whole range of different uh, CPUs, GPUs, etc., FPGAs maybe in the future. And uh, so we need to be flexible and Atlas again will help us with that. But also another approach will help us with that. And that is source to source translation. So what we call like a DSL toolchain. So this may require, in fact, a rewrite of some of our models in some new languages, uh, things that are widely available, that are also widely used in the context of machine learning. Uh, and that would sort of hint towards rewriting models in Python. So much of this is detailed in this ECMW scalability, scalability program technical memorandum, which is available on the ECMW website. This work has been led by Peter Bauer at ECMWF and has been co-funded by a number of uh, activities in, in different projects. And um, this can you can basically follow up on that uh, in there. I mentioned machine learning. It's obviously one of the exciting new developments uh, I recently read a paper also on uh, machine learning essentially replacing the use of partial differential equations. So this is very, very interesting. And uh, we are also looking at options how we can uh, emulate certain elements of the numerical model to improve their efficiency, especially in a time critical window. We're looking at portability issues and we're looking at uh, for the data simulation whether we can uh, emulate tangent and adjoint model codes. So this is definitely an exciting area of development but I won't be talking much about that. So what we have at the moment this is a status quo. This is the run on summit. We can run about 112 forecast days per day at about 3600 nodes in summit. So this is about half what we would need if we were to implement a one kilometer model in operations. So we have, there is a history of uh, running these high resolution simulations with storm scale resolving uh, grid sizes. Um, and so, so we had run an, an, a nature run with our 1279, a 14 month run, which is now available by the Colorado State University. It's a data set that has been used and is used currently also to compare with um, uh, observations and, and future observations, in fact, in order to emulate uh, what a future satellite mission would, would encounter. They're called OSSEs. There have been, we have participated in this Diamond project, which was run by Björn Stevens and MPI in Hamburg. Uh, there's a paper on that as well, and a special issue. Um, and this looked at the dynamics of the atmosphere general circulation models on non hydrostatic domains. This were nine different models participated in this, including, for example, ICON, the FE3 model from the US, and various other models in order to look at uh, how simulations compare when they all run with grid sizes less than five kilometers and when they all explicitly simulate convection. <clears throat> we see a whole range of differences there in these simulations, which is interesting, but it's clearly an evolving area where a lot of people are pushing towards. There's also a Diamond 2 campaign, which is currently ongoing. Um, because the diamond was for a summer period and now this is running for a winter period. And also there's a push to run coupled with an ocean um, to see how basically, uh, what happens when you couple a high resolution atmosphere with a reasonably high resolution ocean and how basically the ocean then may change. So here are some more results from this uh, 1.4 kilometer simulation. On the left hand side, you see the uh, 1.4 kilometers simulation. On the right hand side, you see a composite of Meteosat 8, Meteosat 11, and GOES 15, verifying at the same time. And you can see certainly some resemblance with respect to the convective development. It's a two day forecast on the left, and obviously on the right hand side, it's an actual, uh, well, it's a combination of an actual satellite picture. So then this is what changes when you, when I flick forwards and backwards, you see at nine kilometer resolution, you have um, a, a blur, more blurred picture, you have less vigorous convection and um, you, um, but the patterns are pretty similar still in a broader sense, but there are a lot more smaller, if you like, developments in the parameterized world. So the, clearly the nine kilometer simulation with parameterized convection is pretty good. Um, and the 1.4 kilometer, when we switch off 
one of the most influential parameterizations, deep convection, is still pretty good too. However, if we, uh, if we switch it off at nine kilometer, then we do see deterioration. We see too vigorous convection, and this we can measure in different ways, but you can see that uh, the patterns then start to become um, you know, less good compared to the satellite picture on the right. We can look at global precipitation. So as I said, this was a seasonal simulation. So we ran actually this for November. We started in November, so we had one month spin up. We started on the 1st of November. So then November, December, January, February, we ran this one kilometer simulation on summit. And you can see here the DJF 2019 global precipitation of this simulation. And again, comparing the nine kilometer with it and comparing era five and also the EMERG um, global precipitation data set for DGF 2019. So you can see that actually both the 1.4 kilometer and the nine kilometer overestimate, especially in the equatorial region, substantially the millimeters per day uh, for this period. So there's a lot sharper. Uh, it, overall in the mid latitudes, it's actually very good, surprisingly similar to the other simulations. But in the equatorial region, you see a big change. Now, how good are the observations is an obvious question. We don't know, but uh, it does, it would indicate that, and that you can see also in the bottom picture, that there is a shift, a change in the way pre pre precipitation is represented in the lower resolution simulations, basically having more, you know, this is a PDF, is a distribution. So, so having slightly more uh, precipitation in the lower uh, precipitation amounts and having, um, having substantially more events, basically, with very large precipitation. So we see a shift in the way precipitation falls. And that appears to be, in particular, in the equatorial region. So we also looked at other elements, like updraft helicity of severe convective storm events. So this is um, we, we basically use a simple measure where you use an integral from 500 hectopascal to 850 hectopascal of the vertical velocity W multiplied with vorticity, relative vorticity, and integrated basically over the vertical. So when you, we looked here for a region where we expect uh, tornadoes, now we wouldn't have thought that we could represent tornadoes in a one kilometer simulation. We would probably need much higher resolution. But we do see that both, in fact, the nine kilometer without deep convection parameterization, but also the 1.4 kilometer in particular, um, do indicate a uh, the the typical trop, you know um, tornado activity area here over the uh, southern parts of the U.S. And um, <clears throat> the bottom pictures show the median and the 95th percentile on the left-hand side with vertical velocity and the right-hand side relative vorticity. And, and this is with height. So you can see that most of this is driven by an increase in vertical velocity in the simulations with smaller grid size. But on the right-hand side, you see also that when you, when you look at the nine kilometer simulation with where you just simply switch off deep convection, it, there's also an, an increase in relative vorticity. So it's not only vertical velocity, but it's also this, this change in relative vorticity, especially with height, that uh, is something to maybe investigate further in the future for these uh, severe convective storm events. But in the zonal mean zonal wind, for example, we see uh, that they are all extremely similar, which is nice. And in fact, the one kilometer shows a stronger jet in the northern hemisphere and shows a better tilt compared to the era five in the upper stratosphere. So in fact, there are also positives. And we do believe that actually this better tilt, for example, could result from a, a more realistic propagation of inertia gravity waves into the stratosphere. So stratosphere and the representation of gravity waves may well be a very important, interesting addition when you start to simulate the deep convection explicitly. And this deep convection, in fact, then simulating uh, gravity waves that are you know, not constant in source, but that are intermittent, basically, as these convective events happen. And as we can see, you can't see it on a satellite picture, of course, these gravity waves they are difficult to spot, but you can actually measure in our simulations the zonal mean absolute gravity wave momentum flux. And you can clearly identify in these pictures, especially in these difference pictures, uh, C and B and D, um, where 
the convective regions, uh, the active convective regions do show up basically as differences and therefore as source regions uh, for uh, gravity wave momentum flux. It is also interesting to note that we created these pictures um, as a difference um, because obviously one has 1,279 waves in the nine kilometer simulation, and uh, we have 8,000 waves, spectral waves, spectral wave numbers in the one kilometer simulation. So we're only comparing here wave number 42 to 1279, which are available in both simulations. So this isn't even uh, accounting for the contributions of all the waves beyond 1,000, if you like. Um, it's only looking at the same wave number spectrum in all these simulations, and they are even in, we see, you know, in this, what you could argue, coarser resolution, actually, uh, we see big differences in the gravity wave momentum flux for these different regions. So this comes to the end of my talk, really. Um, the spectral transform method continues to be competitive for global models at kilometer scales. We produced what we might call a first digital twin prototype, um, where we ran this one kilometer grid spacing on summit for a seasonal simulation. And uh, clearly advancing numerical methods continues to be a key contribution towards time and energy efficiency and towards realizing the ambitious goal of routine global kilometer scale data simulation and forecast prediction of the coupled Earth system. And finally, big data handling, unsupervised learning, and near real time tailored impact sector interaction, example, energy, health, hydrology, biodiversity, forms an integral part of future kilometer scale coupled model development. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Nils. Very exciting talk. And uh, there will be questions. I believe you have some time to answer some of the questions. So first, uh, Professor Ravi and Dr. Krishnan, Professor JS, if you have any questions. Uh, may I go ahead and ask please, questions? Please, please, Professor. Uh, thanks, Neil, for a very good and interesting talk. I enjoyed it very much. I hope we'll have a chance to hear you in person and pick your brains more in person whenever we meet. Uh, OK, I have a couple of questions, which I'm sure others are also having. You know, the spectral method, like uh, ECMWF, unlike other places, is still kind of going on with the spectral methods for higher and higher uh, resolutions and also for... Uh, so how do you make it scalable? Because most people have given it up because it's not scalable. Of course, it's more accurate. So how have you made it scalable? And I think related to that is uh, the FLT. What is the advantage of using FLT and how is it used in uh, IFS? Okay, so um, as I mentioned, the um, bandwidth, I mean, you know, the spectral method obviously relies on uh, communication. And so communication bandwidth is uh, an important factor of making the spectral method scalable and, and uh, you know, because you distribute the wave numbers in the same way as you distribute the grid points over a large number of what we call MPI processes. Now, um, this distribution is optimal in grid point space and it's optimal in spectral space. But the problem is you need to transition what we call transpositions between grid point space and spectral space every time. Space. So this requires communication bandwidth. Now, it happens to be that Summit has an excellent communication network that uh, allows to perform these very fast. So we ran these production simulations um, on 960 nodes on summit at one kilometer resolution. And uh, the communication the transposition cost was 18% of the overall cost of a time slot. This is not much. So even though many people have predicted uh, the end of the spectral method, it may well still come. And, and I said, Eastern WA is also preparing uh, for um, you know, a different function space, a different kind of volume based, more local, less communication method. Um, we don't find that on these existing machines like Summit, that it is a substantial bottleneck. We, we find that the communications still perform reasonably well, as long as you do the transposition reasonably well. And one of the factors, I guess, in the ECMWF model is that we, you know, when we do these transpositions, we exploit certain parallelisms. So, you know, you, 
in certain spaces, you don't you have other parallelism. So, for example, when you do the spectral transforms, the transforms don't care whether they deal with temperature, uh, you know, um, whether they deal with surface pressure, whether they deal with the wind. They don't have to be in the same process. So you have flexibility to obviously parallelize those spaces. But there are limits, I agree. And at one kilometer resolution, you have 8,000 wave numbers. So obviously, you can only distribute those 8,000 wave numbers. And, um, and that, that sort of uh, provides limits, too. And then on the, you asked the fast genre transform. Yes, we are using the fast genre transform in this one kilometer simulation. Um, however, um, and it, it, it substantially speeds up the simulation there. However, as we are moving towards more effectively using the GPUs, I would argue that the CUDA FFT and the CUDA blast is at least as effective as uh, going to FLT. So you, so you may not need the faster genre transform when you effectively use the GPUs. That's my experience so far. Thanks, Neil. The second question is on, can you tell us a little more about AI and ML at uh, ECMWF, the kind of efforts that are going on at ECMWF on AI and ML? Um, yeah, it's sort of a spinning. Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, there is the one big area which is data simulation. I, I'm a modeler, so I'm not, you know, I'm coming really. Um, we develop models for data simulation, however, because this is obviously one of the biggest parts of ECMWF activity to produce the best initial condition and work, you know, and get basically a good data simulation. And the argument is that data simulation, in many ways, uh, how it is done at ECMWF today is a form of machine learning. So we, we are already like, you know, in areas of bias correcting uh, errors of the model as part of the uh, assimilation cycle in terms of how we deal with observations in an unsupervised way, how we correct errors of observation, satellite observation in particular, uh, in unsupervised way. We are applying already a lot of these, you know, very, there's this variational bias correction that we run on many of the observation types. There, there's a lot of things that we already do um, they have not been branded as machine learning, but, uh, you know, we call it data simulation. But now this basically everyone is applying these kind of techniques, if you like, that we have already applied for years. So I would argue that in that area, um, we are already doing a lot of machine learning. But then there are a lot of evolving areas um, where ECMW gets engaged. So post-processing, for example, uh, downscaling, even though many of the institutions that we deliver our data to will we'll do that for themselves. So some argue we should just produce the raw data and they do it. Well, we're certainly involved with that. And then there is this whole area of how can we accelerate um, the critical time pass? So for example, think about radiation. Can we uh, run basically lots of simulations on our data to emulate radiation? And then when it comes to running it in the critical one hour when we do produce a forecast, actually use this very fast machine learning matrix, matrix multiply type um, computational pattern based on what we've learned before in order to accelerate that time critical pass. So don't, so run the radiation only in the training period, like the, you know, our radiation parameterization and so on. But then in the actual time critical pass, run the emulation with the machine learning uh, in order to accelerate that time critical pass. So, and that could be thought of perhaps for other parameterizations. There is, I know there's work ongoing at the Oxford University with the gravity wave drag, but you could argue when we go to one kilometer evolution, it's switched off. We don't use the gravity wave drag anymore. So, um, so basically that's um, not really an issue, but it is, but it is kind of uh, looking at what's possible in principle basically. Um, so that's an area, and as I mentioned, there were I saw recently this exciting paper on on numerics, basically, where people start to emulate PDEs, and and uh, I don't know where, how far this will be going, and whether this can really be applied in complex areas, like you know real weather and climate simulations. But um, maybe there is scope, for example, on multi-tracer uh, type uh, efficiency as well. So I am um, you know. Um, this is something that we are not currently investigating, but where I think we should be investigating. Dr. Neil Swedi, this is Krishnan. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for the very exciting talk. Thank you very much. 
Uh, I have uh, one question. You showed the vertical velocity and precipitation uh, near the equator uh, for the nine kilometer and one point four kilometer. Precipitation was uh, substantially higher near the equator. So I was just wondering whether the ITCZ was more narrow in the 1.4 kilometer than the nine kilometers. Yes, I think you can see in this in this sort of simulated satellite pictures, uh, the the ITCZ is is differently structured. It has more kind of cells. The the, the distribution is different. You know, you have like this more. Uh, cellular structural deep convective events in the one kilometer simulation compared to the parameterized convection simulation. And uh, and that goes together with, um, you know, more heavy rainfall in, in more localized places yeah. in the one side and more small amount precipitation in the parameterized where it sort of distributes more and therefore it has less heavy strong events and more small precipitation events over a larger area. And I think you see that in particular in the shape of the ITZ as well. That is very true. Okay. And uh, one more question uh, regarding the digital twin you mentioned. Did you look at some seasonal migration of the ITCZ? No. Um, no, we didn't. Um, we obviously we only ran for four months. So this covers November to February um, 2018 slash 2019. Um, I'm pleased to say that OLCF has given me um, another 500,000 node hours on summer for next year. And that's where we are, want to run also a summer simulation, four months. And yeah. then that might help to address your question a little bit as well. And also, it would cover actually the late monsoon season of 2019, so we could look at that as well, um, which was sort of unusual, I understand. And, and um, so we, could, we would be covering that period. Uh, next year, that's the plan. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, because especially when you showed the Himalayan region with the nine kilometer and the 1.4 kilometer, uh, there's a big improvement in the representation of the orography over the Himalayas. So question yeah. is how it might be affecting the monsoon. Uh, yeah, it's a very interesting question. Totally agree. Um, I don't know. And uh, I think future future years will will have to show <laughs> when we have more time on big computers to actually run these kind of simulations. Stay yeah. more, um, you know. Currently, I guess these simulations are still one-off events, but uh, I would expect with the you know uh, several pre scan machines becoming online in 21, 22 in different countries, um, we will see more of these simulations, and we hopefully be able to address some of these questions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much. Dr. Mahapatra, DGM, sir, do you have any questions to Dr. Nils? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Parthu. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Professor Nils. Actually, it was very uh, interesting talk, and uh, it, it provides a lot of uh, food for thought. And, um, what we see actually, we have um, uh, predominantly utilized the ECM progress model products um, and we benefit a lot from uh, its short to medium range forecast and also the external guidance with respect to the psychogenesis and extreme forecast index. So one of the observations, uh, what we find in uh, in the recent time that uh, the, the predictability with respect to the cyclogenesis over the North Indian Ocean region shows some kind of uh, higher variability as compared to earlier consistence in the forecast. So whether the, the current uh, modeling scenario which is experiencing this type of some kind of uh, false alarm sometimes or missing sometimes uh, because of the changes in the data assimilation or because of the changes in the physics scenario or 
something else which we are not able to capture as operational forecasters. Okay, um, that's a, certainly an interesting comment. Um, we have seen, uh, you know, like perhaps anecdotal um, criticism also with respect to initiation of tropical cyclones in 2020. I don't know if you're referring particularly to 2020. Um, we have made a change in the data simulation uh, in the last cycle, which um, takes information from the model from the previous assimilation cycle in a different way than before. And we suspect that maybe um, some of that could contribute to perhaps a deteriorating behavior in this. But this is subject to ongoing investigation. So we don't really know whether A, it's true or whether it just happened to be the season. But um, all I can say at the moment is that we have, um, you know, a team basically looking at that and investigating whether something really has changed or whether it was basically the, the different uh, weather pattern in 2020. It, when I have recently seen a presentation for 2017 in 2018, especially for tropical cyclone uh, evolution and so on. And uh, there we don't really see a change in the Eastern WF behavior. I mean, we see other models having picked up and getting better maybe a bit of a plateauing from, from our performance, but generally we're, we're still looking quite good there. But 2020 might be different. Yeah. In the long run, I'll tell you, in the long run, we have compared the performance of various models and the SMWF model outperforms. It's forecast accuracy compared to other individual models has performed better in the long run. If you look at, uh, let's say, for example, past five years comparison, certainly SMWF models shows the better performance. And also to you, I want to uh, put it on record that uh, the way in which SMWF has come up with the latest observations and latest uh, model guidance, each and every point, metograms, CPS grams, and a lot of diagnostic products have been added in recent years. Really, the developing countries uh, are benefiting a lot from this. So thank you very much. I congratulate you and the entire issue program. That's, that's very great to hear. But if you have specific feedback where you you know notice what as you described, if you send me or uh, other people at Eastern we have plots about this and kind of give this feedback, um, I don't know whether you have done that already, but if you please do, this would help us also in that investigation. So um, you know, I very much would like to encourage you to send us information when you see you know areas that that you'd like you think could be improved or have changed, this would be very helpful. Usually, we, uh, I am uh, uh, also uh, the nodal point here to coordinate with the and uh, uh, Anna Eli is usually in contact for their operational scenario, which is coordinate this like this. And we also send the comments. We'll be happy to send the comments. But truly speaking, uh, your products and guidance plan and ESMWF is quite helpful. OK, that's great. Thank you. Any any questions from Professor Jess? Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, yes. Dr. Dr. Yes. Bedi, uh, thank you for a very nice talk. From your uh, result, it looks like the nine kilometer with deep convection has some problem. Am I right? Wait, the nine kilometer when you switch off the deep convection um, has certainly some problems because of the too vigorous evolution of gravity waves. The nine kilometer with parameterized convection is, if you like, the best state of the art we have today. But we do see improvements when we switch off deep convection and go to one kilometer. Yeah, so your simulation may help to improve the parameterization, can it? It, um, well, the one kilometer basically uh, gives guidance absolutely yeah. because we are we are thinking that we cannot maybe go to one kilometer in the next few years but we are thinking that we maybe can go to four kilometer in the next few years and at four kilometer you are very much in the middle of uh, the best of two worlds and uh, and we do believe that we are likely to still use the deep convection parameterization but in a different form and in fact we use the one kilometer information to guide us how to okay. perhaps modify this parameterization absolutely right Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you, Jess. Any any questions from Dr. Mitra or NCMRWF, please? Otherwise, Dr. Vinu, can you uh, take Nils to the questions that were asked from the audience? 
Yeah, there are a few questions from the audience. Are you, are you able to see our chat box? Are you familiar with it? Or should I load? Yes. Okay. So there are questions numbered one to six. So if you kindly could read the question and answer, that would be great. Uh, so the first thing is hi there. Is the PowerPoint file for this talk available? Uh, uh, Dr. Niels, you can skip that. You can start with, uh, say, uh, Q2. Are you able to see Q2? Question number two. Um, Dr. R. Patanai. Yes, please start with that. PCO uh, 7999 with 1.4 kilometer resolution is very interesting. How much time it takes for 10 day forecast for the global model? and whether it has shown any improvement from the existing IFS system of ECMWF. Yeah, so um, the, we do basically about 10 days. I mean, we, we could push it more, but the summit system is that they are, you know, I'm not the only one running on summit. And, uh, you know, there, there's a queuing uh, system that you will have to deal with basically, which uh, in practice, it's much easier to use only a fraction of summit. So I use 960 out of the 4,600 nodes on summit. And the production rate at that point is about one uh, week per day. So um, so that's about the forecast days per day. So how does so the 10 day forecast? Um, yeah, so it's basically uh, 24 hours to four, if you like, <laughs> because um, you know, we, we are producing one week in one hour, when well, in fact, 10 days in one hour. Um, now we're producing, if you like, you know, broad 10 days in one day at at this production rate. So it's, uh, you know, for production, it's about a factor you know, 24 away from being used in an operational context, if you like, in that production run that I have uh, run on Summit. But we have run, as I as I showed this graph, we have run the dynamic core, uh, you know, well, it was full physics actually, not just dynamic core, um, up to 3,600 nodes, I think, on Summit um, at a speed of 112 forecast days per day. So that's only a factor of two. So it scales, it would scale further. It's just that the machine is simply not available basically to do to do this regularly. Um, because there's lots of other people running on it. Then in terms of has it improved? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I tried to indicate in my plots that, for example, for the stratosphere, uh, the tilt of the stratospheric jet was slightly better. The gravity waves are actually much more realistic. Um, we do expect, you know, we have some hints that actually the longer term prediction, the feedback from the stratosphere to the troposphere might actually be improved. Um, so this is, of course, single simulation. So, you know, you need a lot more statistics in order to, to get that. Things that haven't improved is, for example, the MJO. Um, I have not seen an improvement, and this is detailed in the paper as well. Um, we haven't really seen an improvement in the, in the MJO. So the parameterized convection run produced a better MJO prediction for that period than the one kilometer. So then uh, there's another question. Is there any critical minimum for the grid distance that we can use in terms of advantage? Um, I'm not sure what is meant here. It would appear that um, you would want to uh, run at least one kilometer grid spacing in order to switch off deep convection from our results. Um, I don't know if that is what is meant, but um, there is no, well, I don't know otherwise what is meant by this question. I mean, ultimately uh, more resolution, at least from our experience, we haven't reached kind of uh, the optimal, if you like. So any further increase in resolution will help if that's what the question is. Uh, what major changes to the code were implemented over the operational IFS? If, if this is with respect to the one kilometer uh, simulation, I am using the fast Legendre transform, which we don't currently use in operations. I am using the single position, which we don't currently use in operations. However, we will use the single position 
um, from next year. Um, I am using the full radiation grid, whereas in the uh, nine kilometer operational, we use a reduced radiation grid. Uh, but other than that, it's very much the uh, operational configuration of the IFS. I don't use the coupled ocean. So we are, um, you know, and this is actually due to the scalability issue of uh, associated Earth system model components that we still need to address. Um, but uh, in operations, we are running with the coupled to the ocean, basically. Then, good afternoon, Nikam found that instead of using single or double precision for all the computations, it is helpful to use a mixed precision approach. The mixed approach uses double precision for geometrical parameters, while other parameters are defined in single position. This doesn't deteriorate the accuracy and decreases the time of computation. What is your experience with IFS in this context? Um, yeah, that's a good question. We also use uh, what you might call a mixed position approach in that we, um, but we have started from a perspective of moving everything to single position and then find those places where uh, basically we require double position. And this is only in very few selected areas. For example, I think in the vertical fine element scheme, um, some pre-computations, the pre-computations of the spectral transforms are done in double position. Even though it was more effort, perhaps we wouldn't have to do that. But at T8000, we wanted to play safe. So we do pre-compute some of the uh, Legendre polynomials in double position and then use them uh, only later in a single position context. Uh, so the matrix matrix multiplies are using SGEM rather than DGEM, for example. This is one of the most important changes. Um, and uh, there are some specific areas, particularly in the physics. And I can tell you it wasn't straightforward to find them you know like um, basically it took years uh, in order to uh, make sure that the performance really is the same and certainly a single position code is also more sensitive to changes on the other hand it makes it more robust so if you you know if you have a dodgy code in your physical parameterization it might blow in single position whereas in double position you get away with it and you will never notice so i think it's been a good review of the ifs code as well by going through that process. Uh, why do you feel DGFEM is good, bad, as it's known to be costly with benchmark problems? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, we are exploring a particular approach in the ESCAPE2 project where we combine the discontinuous Galerkin um, discretization, which is local and highly parallel, um, with long time step solutions of the similar Grangian advection. Whether this will be successful, I don't know, but um, we are certainly developing something in this area to see what can be pushed in this context. Other advantages of the DG approach, like uh, is shown by NRL, would be uh, more adaptivity perhaps to coastlines in the future if we were to apply this technique in the ocean. And, um, and also the ability to adaptively increase spectral resolution in a local area. And that is also explained, um, basically explored in our ESCAPE2 project. And there are papers by Tumulo, uh, which describes the approach we are taking up. Which element under FEM is ideal as per your choice? Which FEM framework do you envisage for future consideration? Um, I think this is sort of similar to the previous question. I think currently we employ um, square elements. Um, and I we are looking at a grid that we may be able to use both in the global spectral transform context as well as in the FEM context, as well as in the um, finite volume context. So basically, we are looking at a grid that may be used in all three so that we can run on exactly the same grid. Whether we will be able to achieve that, I don't know. But um, the one that we have kind of... Um, uh, basically marked out, if you like. Um, I forgot the name now because uh, um, it's um, it's similar to the octahedral grid. That's what I can say, but it's sort of more um, 
it's a heat uh, now now I remember it's a heel picks grid. This is something that we um we're looking at in this context. So we might change the grid again at some point. So also how it is improving orographic rainfall. Uh what is it? I don't know. But um maybe you, this can be clarified. At night, can you clarify this question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it is just uh, in continuation to the previous question. As you said that uh, gravity waves, this is improved because of the one resolution improvement here. So how best really it is improving this 1.4 resolution, improving the orographic rainfall? Is there any specific, uh, because that is also main concern area that models are showing with very low rainfall in Western Ghat region of India, etc. So how it is improving the orographic rainfall? Uh, that's a very good question. Okay, you mean like how the one kilometer simulation basically improves the rainfall in, say, orographically challenging areas? I have no idea. Uh, this has not been investigated. The data is in principle available from OLCF. So if you wanted to investigate it, I'd be looking forward to it. Um, and it's certainly something that we should be looking at more in the future. Um, but I haven't. So I don't know is the answer. Um, I do know that in the diamond, there have been some investigations, but that's where we ran only at four kilometer resolution. And we know now that, you know, switching of deep convection at that resolution is questionable. And uh, and with there, we did see errors actually in, you know, the, the increased orography did not necessarily improve the precipitation. And there were, there were distinctively different behaviors also between the different models, whether the rainfall was on the slope or away from the slope. Uh, there was some comparison I've seen with observations where clearly uh, most models were raining in the wrong place. Uh, but there was a change. There was a change, a distinct change from parameterized to non-parameterized. So it's certainly an interesting area to investigate, but it's also a difficult one uh, in terms of observations, because um, you know the observation locations are often not necessarily representative. So because they are in a valley, and you know, and you don't resolve the valley yet in the model, and you know, it's it's a tricky one actually, both from an observational point of view as well as from a modeling point of view. So there's definitely a lot more to be done on that one. Thank you. And then at the moment, AIML is still costly for PDE tackling. Uh, great to hear that because I'm obviously a strong believer in properly solving PDEs. Can you elaborate your idea on AIML replacing regular NWP modeling? Please comment on pins based ML for NWP. I have no idea what pins is, uh, I should point out. I'm also um, fairly new still to the whole AI and machine learning kind of uh, subject. Uh, but I have somebody in my team, Peter Dubin, who uh, is collaborating closely also with Oxford and has sort of various efforts and papers on uh, machine learning. Um, I am skeptical personally that it will replace regular NWP modeling, I should point out as well. Um, but I do think that we should, um, you know, look at basically the different uh, approaches and, and different methods that are evolved there and follow them closely. Because um, for some ideas, in particular, for example, in the context of traces, I am, I am more hopeful, you know, that something could actually be done. And, um, and so I'm with that. Yeah, that's all the questions we could uh, select as the, the best suitable. But there are so many other questions as well. I request the audience will have to directly contact Dr. Neil to clarify. And Dr. Pats also, please uh, take it further from your question. Yeah. So, so, so we will conclude. So th Nils, thanks. Thanks a lot for you know sparing your time and giving such an excellent uh, talk, educating a lot of. I mean, usually we are also trying TCO in you know for GFS context. So thanks a lot. And uh, we'll be again hearing when there'll be some more new development from ECMW. And thanks to all the panelists, all the experts, Professor JS, DGM, Professor Abhi, and Dr. Krishnan, and all the IMD colleagues and NGMW, and all the audience. Thank you, Neil.
Well, thank you very much, and also for all your questions. You know, it uh, it shows you have listened really carefully, so that's great. You know, um, um, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, Nate.